much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Perfect. I'm glad that you're all here. I hope you're all caffeinated. If we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Paul. Uh, I used to work at the University of Missouri for a couple of decades, where I was in charge of building and maintaining their processes and workflows for managing their fleets of WordPress sites with so deep history in both higher education and WordPress. I'm now a developer relations engineer at platform.sh. If you're not familiar with us, we are a secure integrated enterprise grade platform as a service provider. We remove the complexities of cloud infrastructure management so you and your dev teams can spend more time responding to the changing needs of your institution and supporting your institutional missions and less time fighting cloud infrastructure. So whether it's one site or a thousand, whether it's WordPress or Drupal or Django or Gatsby or whatever you need to run, you can manage all of that from one central location and we can play a crucial role in your end-to-end -end testing. Now, before I get started, I do want to give you a couple of warnings. The first is I am not a testing expert. This presentation, like most of my presentations, came about because I was given a task. I was told to add end-to-end -end testing and some of the things that we support. Didn't know about it, so I had to go learn it. In that process, I thought maybe others can learn from my mistakes. Uh, Ashton, the W the WP Campus channel, if anybody is interested, in it, I got a great response back and it's my presentation. Uh, the second thing is that I'm going to do all this live today. So you know how live demos go, so wish me luck. Uh, and the other thing is I'll probably take up a full 45 minutes. Now, my goal is for you, when you leave here today, I want you to be able to define what end-to-end -end testing is. I want you to be able to remember at least one advantage that end-to-end -end testing brings your, to your workflows as well as your organizations. That you understand what Cypress is, how to install it, how to configure it, and write at least your first test. And that you're familiar with the strategies and best practices and have all that foundational knowledge that you need in order to build the second, and the third, and the fourth test. So how many of you here are already doing some form of automated testing in your workflows? Wonderful. How many of you are doing end-to-end -end testing? Couple? Okay. So for everybody else, if you were to give it, be given a task where you needed to write some new feature or new functionality, how would you go about verifying that what you've written is working the way you expect it? Visit the site. What's that? Visit the site. Visit the site and do it manually, right? Well, that's all automated testing in, in testing is, is we are going to mimic the real, a real user and then try to replicate the steps that they would take and then verify that the application has done exactly what we expect it to. That's all into end testing. It's just the automation of that manual process. Now, it does bring some great benefits. A lot of, in a lot of cases, we can't surface problems with our software until it is working in that real-world scenario where it's, it's actually interacting with the database. It's got the user interface in front of it. It's connecting to all those third-party services. We really can't surface those problems until we've tested it just like the user. But that takes time. So that's where that automation benefits. In addition, because we can catch those bugs before they occur, uh, before we release them into production, excuse me, then it's much less costly to fix them after they've made it to production. Once we get our test passing, then we have a very high level of confidence that what we're introducing or what we're deploying to production is going to work exactly as we expected, and that it's not going to negatively affect the user experiencing, ultimately increasing our quality assurance. Last, if you're working with departments where they're giving you a set of features that they want, and you can write your test to verify those features, well, then you can ensure that you're in alignment with those business requirements. Now, how does end-to-end -end testing differ from some other testing? Well, if you're familiar with the testing, automated testing strategy pyramid, we do unit tests at the bottom. We do a whole bunch of them, but they're isolated. We're just testing individual pieces. Then we move into integrated testing, where we're beginning to test our code with external services. We do fewer of those, because it's a little harder to do. And then there at the top, we do end-to-end -to -end testing, where we're testing everything. But because we're testing everything, it's much more complex. We do fewer of those, with the goal being that those manual tests are very few and far between. Now, if you're not familiar with the other two, unit testing is the idea in an ideal world, and I know higher ed is not ideal, but in an ideal world, you actually write a test to test some minute, the smallest piece of functionality you can. And then you write, you actually write the test before you write the functionality. So in your programming language, that's usually a function or a method. 
And then as you write that function or method, you continuously test it over and over and over again. But we isolate it. We stub out all its external requests. So we're only testing that functionality. That's why we do it very often, because it gives that immediate feedback. Now, once we start getting greens, we're passing all those unit tests. Then we move into clicker again, integrated tests. So we might take individual units that we've been testing and now group them together and begin to test them as a group. We might take our code and begin testing with external dependencies or external services with the goal of surfacing any issues in the communications between our code and those external dependencies. And then we come back to engine testing again where we're mimicking everything from start to finish and trying to verify exactly as a user would that our features are working. Now, with that said, the reason we have to do it far off or far less often is because it's more expensive. And that can be both monetary, because we're going to have to have an environment or a server set up in order to run these tests, but also human resources. It takes time to write out all of these tests. Now, occasionally I'll mention brittleness. It can also be a bit hard to maintain. So as an example, let's say you write a feature, you're going to add a menu item to the admin bar. And then you're going to have the user go somewhere, they're going to have a panel, they're going to fill in some information and do something. We can write the test and get it and verify it's all working correctly. And then in the next iteration, someone decides to change the ID on that menu item. Well, now suddenly we can't go to that menu item in our test like we did previously in the test breaks, even though the functionality is still there. So that's just an example of a brittle test. So we have to be aware that these can be a bit brittle. So Cypress, how many of you have heard of Cypress? You might play with it. Couple? Okay. So for everybody else, Cypress is an open source automated testing framework whose main goal when they designed it or began to build it was to expedite the time between when you install it and as a developer start writing your test. In previous times, in the dark ages, I guess, uh, there was a lot of configuration, there was a lot of setup in order to build this automation of the browser. And their goal again was to get you in there and writing those tests as fast as possible. Now, it does bring in some specific advantages. So it is open source and they have an optional SaaS product, but it doesn't use Selenium. It doesn't use web drivers. It uses an Electron app and it embeds your application, your web application, inside that Electron app, meaning it's all running inside the browser. So it's very, very fast. Now, they support all the browsers except Safari, which Safari is on the roadmap. Um, the other cool piece is time travel and test replay. So when you run a test, you can go back and you can replay the test and watch your application state change as it moves through all the steps. Time travel then allows you to go back to an individual step and see your application state, how it's performing and looking exactly at any step and move backwards and forwards. In addition, anything that you output to the console will be available in that step and it provides a whole host of debugging tools for you to be able to debug your test and find out exactly why it's failing. Some other cool parts are auto waiting. So when you visit a site, it'll automatically follow redirects until it gets to 200. Then once it gets the page, it'll wait for that page's load event to fire before it continues on. If you're asking for a DOM element, like in a dynamic application, it'll automatically wait until that DOM element's available or until it times out. So auto waiting is a great feature for you to be able to, to make sure that things have loaded in the way that you want. Network tracker control is also really cool. You can intercept any request. So any request from any point or location, you can intercept that. You can inspect it. You can change the data that it's sending out. When the payload is returned, you can catch the payload and manipulate that data. Or you can catch it and return your own data, never allowing it to go back out. So lots of incredibly cool features. Now, it is not the only game in town. There are several alternatives to Cypress, including, there it goes, Playwright, Nightwatch, uh, WebDriver, Codeception, et cetera. Um, I'll tell you that the Gutenberg team, and don't quote me on the dates, but I think it was 2019 was on Cypress. Then sometime around 21, 22, they moved to Puppeteer, which is backed by Google. And as of February of this year, they're now on Playwright, which is backed by Microsoft. Now, personally, coming out of my 20 plus years in higher ed, I have a great respect and value for those tools that I can depend on for a long time. Right? I never had the opportunity to change my tooling in 18 months. That was not an option. I needed something that I could depend on for three to five years. So I am sticking with Cypress because their documentation is excellent. They have not only thorough documents, but they have guides, they have tutorials, they have videos, they have tons of example code. Again, with that goal of getting you to writing your test 
as quickly as possible. Now that said, you know, maybe next year I'll be back here talking about playwright. I'm not sure, but for now, <laughs> excellent. All right. So installing Cypress, again, go as fast as possible, right? It is as simple as an NPM install. And this is where we switch to the live code. So start wishing me luck that we have some internet here. So I'm going to go ahead and start that. Why is it not clicking? There it goes. What's going on? Oh, it's back here. That's interesting. Let's try it clear. Now that the NPM install. And that is it. That's all you have to do to get it installed. It will automatically download the dependencies and build the Electron app based on your operating system. It should actually be there. It is. It's done. From there to configure Cypress, all we have to do is open. So I'll just open this up. Here it goes. Build that app. First time it runs, it says, hey, you don't have any configuration files. What are we doing today? Are we running end to end tests or are we running component testing? We're going to focus on end to end. So as soon as you click on that, it says, OK, I'll configure things for you. In the background now, once it updates, notice I've got a configuration file and a collection of supporting files. And that's it. That's all you have to do to configure. From there, you just pick which browser you want to start testing in. So I'm running my presentation in Chrome today, so I'm going to use Firefox. Go ahead and launch that. And then just like with the configuration, as soon as it comes up, it says, I don't see any testing files. Testing files in Cypress are referred to as spec files. It says, do you want me to give you some scaffolding files, some examples, so that you can start building your own? Or would you like to go ahead and write your first test? So let's go ahead and write our first test. I'll call this one oops, first. And then create that. And in the background, it has written that file in a directory called E2E, end to end. Can everybody see that code? Is that big enough? I hope that's big enough. All right, what I'd like to do is, as we go through this, kind of break down all of these parts. So that very first part we have is called describe. The describe block is simply an organizational tool for you. You can have multiple describes inside a single spec file. You can nest describes inside of a, a describe. It is simply an organizational tool. It takes two parameters, a title that you want to have show up in the testing tool to identify your group of tests, and a callback function. We put our tests inside the callback function. So then notice the next piece down is it. It blocks contains two things. It's where we put our test, and it takes a label, again, to show up in the testing tool so we can identify the test we're running, and then another callback function. That callback function is where we put our actions and our assertions. We're actually going to start doing some things. So if we are testing a web application, what is the first thing you probably need to do? Yeah, you got to get to the application, right? So usually one of the first things you're going to do or use is side.visit. That is going to load in a URL. So it is going to default to a GET request. It is going to follow any 300 redirects until it gets to a 200. Then once it gets that 200, it will wait until the page is uh, loaded at fires. So I'm going to go back into our code. I'm going to update it. And this is a little hard to see with all this other Zoom stuff. So if I misspell things, we'll just go with it. Um, it didn't say, it says it passes, uh, has valid title. No, I think I totally missed it. What was that? What was that? There we go. Wow. Yeah. And we're going to go ahead and run this. So let's run the spec. Oh, I forgot to mention, I am running uh, DDEV. Are you familiar with DDEV? A couple of you. So DDEV is a local development environment. Uh, I use it a lot because we have an integration with it, which allows me to clone my production site. Oh, which I also forgot to tell you about. I have a production site. This is my production site. So this allows me from platform to clone my production site locally into DDEV. And I'm going to go grab that. So I'm going to say DDEV. Hopefully that's the right one. There we go. So this is the URL that is assigned to my local instance. Let me go back into my tests. Let's update this. There we go. We'll save that and rerun our tests. There it goes. And now we can see that we have, hopefully you can see that, versus home page. That was that title. I gave it to the describe. 
and then we made the test itself. And the test body currently just has visiting the site. All right, once we have visited somewhere, what do we need to do next? In other words, I want to, I want to uh, verify that this page is what I expect it to be. Yeah, just give me a shout out. Check the page title. Check, check the page title, right? Yeah. You need to get some DOM element and then verify it contains data, it has a class, it's visible. We need to, in some, some way, validate the page is what we thought it was going to be. So sci.get allows you to get one or more DOM elements from the page. Um, it is going to yield back that DOM element to the next thing that we chain to it. Uh, it is always going to start, it's important to remember, it's always going to start from sci.root, which is typically the document root. So if I do sci.get main and then another change get, it's not going to limit the searches into that. It's going to go back to the root. Now, there's other ways to do that, but just not with sci.get. So sci.get is how we're going to get our elements. Um, and just like the others, it's going to automatically keep tree trying to get that DOM element until it either exists or we reach some time out. So I'll go back into our code and I'll add in sci.get. And let's get the title. There it is. And then what do we need to do? Tell it what it should be. Tell it what it should be, right? And so the method we use is should. So we're going to use the should method on that DOM element, and that is what's going to create our assertion or our validation. Now, it accepts a Chai-compatible stream. Chai is a behavior-driven development, testing-driven development. I use things, that's a lot of words. Uh, assertion library. Let's just use plain English words to describe the assertion of the validation we're trying to make. Um, it is always going to yield back the same subject it was given. So if I give it the title element, I make some assertion, if it passes, it'll give it to the next, which means I can chain assertions. And then it's automatically, just like the others, automatically going to keep retrying to get a positive assertion until it reaches a timeout or ultimately fails. So in this case, I'm going to break this the first time just so we can see it. So I'm going to say should contain, and I'm going to say WP Campus 2023. And let's run that test. And notice it fails. Because this is in 2023, right? So I've got a nice little red check. I mean, you might not be able to see the red. A little red check mark there up next to the test. And the test has failed. The assertion did not pass. So now I'll come back in and hopefully oh, I can't quite see this. There we go. Now it is actually, it also watches. So it's going to watch your test and automatically rerun it. So it's probably already reran that test and it did. So now I've got a nice green assertion. I'm also colorblind, so if that's not green, somebody please tell me. I'm assuming it's green. Okay, so we got a green assertion and a green check mark, which means that you have now just completed your first test. <laughs> there we go. Right. I know that's a very simple test, right? But for me, the hardest part about some new thing, right, is just getting the thing installed, getting it configured, and then doing something. So if you can go back now and install it, configure it, which is basically just open it, and then you write just a simple test of go to my home page and make sure the title's right, you've now incorporated it into your workflow. The next one will be that much easier. In fact, as we begin working, or as you begin working towards writing your next set of tests, there are some things to keep in mind. One is that right, the hardest part about writing tests is knowing what to test. That's the hardest piece. So my suggestion will be the next time that you're given a task or feature that's supposed to be incorporated into your site, write down all the steps that you take to manually verify it. Go in and say, okay, I clicked here, I clicked here, I clicked here, I clicked here. And at the end, this is what should be on this page. Or this is how it should react. Keep breaking those down into smaller and smaller steps, and then convert those steps and actions into a test. And then keep running that test until you figure out, as long as the feature is working, until you figure out how to make sure you're writing correctly. Um, make sure you're testing both the happy paths and the unhappy paths. So what I mean by that is if we were testing the login form, we'll say. A happy path will be I put in a username and password that's correct. I click submit. I get somewhere in the admin area, and in the upper right is my username. This is how it all, right? That's a happy path. An unhappy path would be I put a username and password that aren't correct. I click submit. I come back to the form, and now I have an error message. 
So we want to make sure we're testing the unhappy paths to ensure the application is still acting and performing the way we expect it to, even if the user doesn't follow the correct steps. Now, a good test should cover three phases. One is setting up the application state. We'll talk more about application state later. The next is to take those actions, again, mimicking the user, performing the steps necessary to test this feature. And then last is to make an assertion about that resulting state. Now, you may see this referred to as a range, act, and assert, or you might see it referred to as given, when, then. So if we think back to the first test, given I'm an anonymous user, when I visit the home page, then the title of the page should be WP Campus 2024. Make sense? So be thinking in those terms. Given some state of the application, when I do these steps, then the application should be this way. The other piece to think about as you're writing these tests is you should try to make them such that they are independent from each other. What I mean by that is if I have four tests, I don't want test three to be dependent on the state that test one created. Because one, test one may pass incorrectly and leave me with improper state. Or two, it might fail and leave me with state that is going to negatively affect other tests. So we want to make sure that any test can run independently of the others. Are you ready to write the second test? Yeah. 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 There we go. That's what I'm going for. Okay. So I'm going to come in here and create a second file. So let me get up there. And we'll give a new JavaScript file, and I'll call this one off. Dot side. And let's say I'll do describe, and we are going to describe this as off test. Generic. Myself a callback. And then I'm going to do it cut off. It's easy so far, right? Nothing too complicated. Another the callback function, lots of callbacks. And then what's the first thing I need to do if we want to test the login form? I need to visit the login form, right? So I'm going to go side.visit. I'm going to go back to DDEV. I'm going to grab my address again. Come back in and say go visit there with WP login. Now, can anybody foresee an issue that I have just created between off and first? Specifically in the visit. Where's that URL right now? Homepage. Homepage of where's it running? Local. Local. What if I need to run my intent test on a shared development environment? What if I need to run them in a staging environment or a PR environment or somewhere else? All right, so we need to talk briefly about configuration. So one of the options in the configuration file is something called base URL. Base URL allows us to define a domain and then any calls to site out visitor site out request that are relative will have that prepended. But the really cool thing is that it can be overridden by other environment variables. So Cypress does have a processing order for environment variables. And so for that special base URL variable or any other environment variables we need to create, we can either put, we can put them in config. Then we can also write an M file that will override those. Or if the system where we're running Cypress run or Cypress open has environment variables that are prepended with Cypress underscore, it'll automatically parse all those and override any of the others. Or at the time we run Cypress, we can also pass in overrides for the config or those environment variables. Or it's not even on the slide, in an individual test, you can override any config or those environment variables, giving us a lot of flexibility. So that just means we can write our tests such that we can run them anywhere and not have to worry about changing the test for any specific environment. So I'm going to go in here and I'll open up the configuration file. And I'll add that base URL in. There it is. And I'm going to say maybe normally, and everybody else on the team uses uh, local.site. And I'm the oddball out. All right, now if I run that right now, watch site. Cypress closed out, comes back, and it says, comes back. It says, hey, I can't get there because there's nothing there, right? So if I come back in, I'm going to close Cypress out first. Close Cypress. So we can rerun this. 
I'll come back into my testing environment. Can you see down at the bottom? Hopefully, I'm going to do an export where I'm X setting base URL equals that address I used earlier. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'll do NPX open again. Whoops, I'm over too far. There we go. And then in my test here, I will update those two tests. Let me turn on my volume here. Let's update these tests to just be around the place. That one we're in my auth. Oops, there it is. And if we save those and go back out to Cyprus, relaunch testing environment. You know, and now if I run first, we still go back to our local instance. And if I run off, we end up at the login. Now, I need to do a pull request, and I have a workflow that builds out a copy of that environment. I don't have to change my test. It's all going to work. It's all, I'm going to be able to run those directly on that environment that I have to change my test. Now, if we're testing the login form, what do we need to do next? We need to type in a username and password. One of the cool things about this environment is if you notice this little button up next to the URL, it will give you an element suggested selector. That's a lot of words. So I'm going to go that. And as I hover around in here, it's going to say, hey, here's all these different elements you can select. If I click on it, then it gives me an option to copy it to my clipboard. So now I can go back into my test. So I can say, all right, we are going to go in here and we're going to get that element. Now, one thing I'll suggest that I've learned is go ahead and do a clear on the element. That just clears out the element in case there was placeholder text or anything else. And from there, I can type. And I'll say uh, Bob. And then what's the next piece we need? You can see it's already right Bob there. What's the next piece? Password. Password. So let's see. Sometimes it doesn't, if you rerun it, it doesn't always redo the selector. So let's grab that again. There we go. And then here. And we'll drop down and do this. Uh, oh, pasted. There we go. And another clear. And another type. And then one, two, three. Save that. Come over to our test. Now we got Bob and one, two, three. What's the last thing we need to do? I heard two things. I heard enter and I heard click. You can do both. So one thing you could do is you could go in, you could simulate button presses or key presses using curly braces and a short phone for that key. So I'll go ahead and do that. Or if we want, and wipe that all. Oops. One, two, three. And then come back over and I grab that button. Is that button's name? That. Come back in here, get that, and do a click. Not cool. <laughs> wow, you're a tough audience. You're not. <laughs> <helpful. laughs> <laughs> So can anybody foresee a problem with what I've done here? SSO. Oh, well, SSO might be one thing, which, <laughs> which highlights, uh, yeah, <laughs> you're highlighting the problem. What is wrong? And we'll get to later. This, this. Yes. hard coded, right? We don't want that. But we have the ability to add starts with an e. environment, environment variables, right? So I can go back into my config and I can say, hey, I want to add environment variables. Oops, that is not the right key. Let's try that one. There we go. And I can say, hey, I want test user and I want test user default to Bob. Oh, we'll do Bob too. See, it changed. And then I need test user pass. And I want that to be default to uh, four, five, six, seven. Right now, if I update that and I come back into my test, I can get rid of those statically static values, and I can say, hey, I want to use cypress.env, and I want you to go retrieve test user. And I want you to go here, and I want you to go retrieve cypress.env test user's pass. And if we save that, assuming I didn't make any typos, it's using Bob too now. Which means then in another environment, I can add those environment variables. It'll automatically pick those up. All right. Now, there is one piece I want to mention real quick. And that is you do need to decide on a strategy for managing state. 
Now, this particular slide is about state of a user since we're testing a user, but this applies to state of the application itself as well. So one strategy is you can stub requests. Remember I mentioned the intercept? So we could intercept requests to WP login, catch that, and then return back static information about the cookies and the session information. It's nice because it's really fast and I don't have to have an environment. I don't have to set up a database. But notice he's grimacing, but it requires fixtures. Fixtures are the static data that you want to return back. So if he's grimacing because if the cookie information and the session information changes in the app, I've got to remember to go back and update that static information I've saved. But it's also not a true end-to-end -end test, right? In an end-to-end -end test, we really want to try to mimic as close as real world as possible what the end user is experiencing. So the next strategy is a static user where we go into our system, we actually create a user that we're going to use in our test. And it's nice because then it is a real end-to-end -end session, right? We've got a database. We've got a real user, but we, that means we have to have an environment where we can put a database and we're going to have to set up the database, whether that's exporting from some other system and importing in there or maybe automating the installation of WordPress and setting up that state. The downside, though, is that particularly in WordPress, your user, as they do things, the state of what is associated with them changes and is stored in the database, right? So we end up with dangling state or stacking state, which could affect reruns of the test or future tests, because we've got that state, that state saved with the user. So the last type is a dynamic user where you're going to delete and re-add the user before every test. This is a true end-to-end -end test because now we're recreating exactly the experience that that user would have. We don't have to worry about any of that, uh, any of that state mutation or dangling state. But we do have to do the whole tear down and rebuild of that state with the database every time, which means it is a bit more slow, a bit more complex. Well, purposes of today, I'm going to do, as soon as I find the right keys, I'm going to have DDEV create a user for me. I have him create Bobby2. I'm going to take this password so we have a real live user. Copy that, come back over to Cypress. I'll close out our tests. Close Cypress. And come back. And before I launch it, I'll do an export of those values. All right, so I'm doing an export of test users. So now we're going to use Bobby2 and that password. Now if I rerun Cypress. Yeah, let's relaunch our end-to-end -end testing. Now, if we go to the auth test, ta -da! we have a real user. Yay, we're all good. All right, now, how do we validate this work? Because the what you get, if you don't put in the correct username and password, you go back to the login form, but it does send a 200, you technically need to pass it. So, how can we validate this work? Uh, grab the username yeah. and the corner. So I'm going to go up here. I'll use that picker. I'll say, hey, give me this. I'll grab that. I'll go back into my test. Say, okay, after you click, it's automatically going to wait until the next page loads. So then I can say, get that. I'm going to drop down because it's getting a little long. And I'm going to say, should contain. And then I'll go back and say, cypress.m and test user. Oops, except I have to spell it. Test user. Now, if I save that, we rerun the test. Yay! There it is. There's our, there's our assertion. It's nice and green. We passed. Good. Everybody gets so far. Okay. So now, let's say we want to extend the test. We just did the right in the second test. Say we want to extend it. Oh, don't do that. Forget you saw that. I'm sorry. I went too far. So we want to extend this test. Let's say now we want to have a second test where. Um, can add CPT post. We got custom post type. Maybe they have a custom role. This user has a custom role. We want to verify that they can create that post type and see it. One thing I have not mentioned is that when you run each, when you run Cypress, when it runs each test, it's just like it is using incognito mode or private mode for every test. It means it brings up an instance, it runs, it finishes, it closes it. Which means if I try to go here and do sci.visit and then maybe do like a slash WP or get yeah, WP admin type today slash edit. 
what's going to happen? It'll, it'll, it'll succeed in that it'll be a 200, but it's not going to go to the right place, right? So should I copy all of this content and paste it into the next test? Okay, the, the, the shaking of the head no is the correct answer, right? Instead, remember I said it gave us a bunch of supporting files. One of those files is called commands. That allows us to create our own custom commands. So I can use cypress.commands.add. The first parameter is the name of the method, this new command you want to call. So I'll say wp login. The second is, guess what the second one is? Callback function. There it is, callback function. Callback function. And then inside of here, we can put in that code. Now, do I still want to use these environment variables? Maybe. What if I want to test multiple users? Instead, I could say, all right, the callback function will accept a username and password. Now I can go in here and wipe this out, get rid of this. All of it. There we go. You say username. And username here. Oh, that was password. Sorry. That will that'll fail. Let's try password. There we go. And get rid of down here and do username. Oh. Then back in my off test, what I can do is say psi.wp login and then hand it in the long keys here, cypress.m pass it test user and password. And I'm going to test user pass. The one downside of live is I am not fast hyper. All right, now let's go see if that worked. There's our off test. The first one said, yeah, and look, it ran all the code and we, oh, wow, oh, this is a good time to show you. Remember that time travel? Here it is, all the different states. You can see it got the input for the username, types it in, there's the next one after the password, you can type it in, click submit, follows, 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 all the way there, and there's our assertion. Cool. All right, so now let's say I do want to make that next test the same. Should I copy this line and paste it in? No. So just like with WordPress, Cypress gives you hooks. One of those hooks is to run something before each test. Guess what it takes? Whoops, that's too many. Callback. A callback. Yeah, <laughs> oh, everything's a callback. And so now I can take this line. Uh, can I actually let's do it this way? It is running off the side of my screen. I can't see it. Cut it from there. I'll put it up here. Right. Now, if I run that, notice not only did it do it on the first one, it also did it on the second one. And now at the end, oops, it actually did it there. There's there. This is the edit page. All right, but. It is doing, it's going to the form, it's getting the elements, it's putting in the information every single time. Two tests, but I'm not a big deal. We're gonna get 15 tests. Wouldn't it be nice if instead, this is I didn't want you to see earlier, if we could save the session data? Yeah, so we have that ability in Cypress. It will take a session that we've created and it'll store it based on some ID. Now it takes four arguments. I bet you can guess what a couple of them are. Uh, the first one is an ID on how we wanna identify that session. The next one is a callback where we run our validation or we set up code, excuse me. The third option is another callback where if we restore a session, we can validate the session. And if the validation fails, it'll rerun the setup code. And the fourth is whether or not we want to share this saved session with additional spec files. So I'm going to go add this to ours. Go back into commands. I'll grab all of this, cut it out, and say, all right, side.session. I'll use the username as our ID, give it a callback for the setup, and then paste our information back in. And now if I save and run these tests, notice the first time it says, hey, I need to create the Bobby2 session. And then it runs through, oops, runs through all those steps just like earlier. But in the second time, it says, hey, I need the Bobby2 session, but I'm going to restore it. And now it doesn't have to do this. 
Yeah, this is huge. This is really important because how many of you are probably going to have to going to need to do authenticated session tests, right? This is one of the hardest parts that I came across, and the reason why is that between uh, version twelve and version thirteen, Cypress introduced that feature, which greatly uh, made it easier to save session information. If you just go start searching Google for how to do this. Then what you end up is on a bunch of articles and blog posts about how to do it the old way, which no longer works. So one, go read the docs first. But second, they introduced this. So I wanted to make sure you saw that. Uh, in my last few minutes that I have, uh, I wanted to kind of give you a couple of best practices to remember or think of as you're beginning to write these tests. Uh, the first is if you don't need to actually test the login form, don't bother me bringing Chrome into this. Uh, instead, programmatically do that. And what I mean by that, it's the wrong file. So grab this file is instead of visiting the page, do a post to the WP login. Otherwise, it's the exact same. Same name for the method, uh, same session set up, but otherwise I'm just I'm posting that information programmatically so I don't have to go and bring up Chrome and login all the pieces. All right, the next thing to think about as you're doing this is one of the trade-offs of using Cypress, especially if you're already a JavaScript developer, is you can't assign the returns from a Cypress command to a variable or a constant. Can't do it. You can only access those returns via closures and aliases. Some people find that really jarring. Again, it's the trade off of speed, right? If you want to be able to quickly get into this, then you have to kind of use their opinionated way. Uh, the next thing, and I mentioned this earlier, is remember try to set the state before each test so that we can run any of those tests at any point. And last is try not to use brittle selectors. IDs and classes change. Sometimes even the location of an element may change without being visibly noticeable, right? And so Cypress suggests you using data attributes where you can set unique data attributes that never change to ensure that those tests aren't brittle. Okay, pop quiz. Who can define end-to-end -end testing? Perfect. Anybody define end-to-end -end testing? This was my goal. I don't want to fail my goal. Somebody. That's <laughs> increment <laughs> Testing what? From end to end. From end to end, right? <laughs> yeah, test all the parts, right? From beginning to end, we're going to try to mimic a user walking through the paths of our application and then validate that what they did, our application, responded correctly. Can anybody tell me one benefit of end to end testing? Save time. Save time, right? Way faster, basically doing manual testing, but a lot faster because the computer is way faster than you. All right, does everybody feel comfortable with what Cypress is? Installing it, configuring it, which is just opening it, and maybe writing your first test. I had a question. Sure. About that. So, did, in the code, you wrote Cypress with a capital and then CY with the underline. What's the difference? There are, so CY is where inside of your test you're going to use, there are some other commands to access the global Cypress application by getting the environment variables. Okay. Um, that's going to be back to the docs to know which one is which. So does everybody feel comfortable writing that first test? Feel fairly comfortable with best strategies on how to write your second and third test? Okay, then what I want to show you last is kind of putting it all together and give you an idea of a real world scenario of where this is running. So one of the other reasons that I happen to love Cypress is that they have a very well documented and very stable GitHub action. Which means that in my GitHub workflows, when I go to create a pull request, I can have Cypress automatically run all of my end-to-end -end tests. At Platform, we also have an integration with GitHub. So when you create a pull request, if you're with us, then it sends us that pull request code. We then clone your production environment into an isolated environment using that pull request code, bring up the environment, give it an ephemeral URL, and send that ephemeral URL back to GitHub. Which means then, that when I go to run, I like that. When I go to run the action for Cypress, what can I pass in? Right. That URL of that clone of my production environment, which means when I run those end-to-end -end tests, they are exactly what I would have in production, which greatly boosts the confidence in what I'm about to deploy. All right, so I'm going to show you this in practice here. So I have a pull request open. Again, for my production site here. And I can see down here at the bottom with my checks, platform completed, and it deployed that environment. Go ahead and open that up so you can see it. 
I've got a nice clone in my production environment assigned to pull request three. Now I also can see that my end-to-end -end testing failed. So I go into the details. I'm going to scroll up to the summary. Gives me a nice little result. It says, hey, you got six tests that passed, one test failed. If you integrate your project with the Cypress Cloud, and they do offer you a free tier, then you can go back and replay the test. So now because this test failed, I can go in and say, hey, I want to replay this. I can rerun it. And on the left-hand side, it's going to walk through each of the steps it performed. And on the right-hand side, I'll be able to save the state of that application. In this case, it was supposed to be able to delete. A user is supposed to be able to delete their own posts. So now I've got this saved state of my application. I can see the trash can is missing. So that's why it failed. So now I have the ability to go into this testing tool and use the debug tools and figure out what happened. Is maybe the custom role didn't come out correctly or, or whatever happened. Make sense? All right. Cool. So um, I've got, I think, zero minutes for questions. I don't remember. <laughs> okay. okay. Sorry. 50 minutes. All right. 50. Yeah, yeah. The lunch is at noon. Oh, okay. Well, I'll go ahead and put this is the wrong screen. Why is this not showing me? I'll see you. Again, it's that one. Huh. This is no longer showing up in the share. There, there's the QR code to do the session feedback. Um, remember, and remember that enters you in for all of the door price drawings. So you definitely want to do that. And I would appreciate any of that feedback. Um, I love doing these presentations, but I'm always looking for ways to improve them. So I would greatly appreciate any suggestions that you have. If you do ever need to contact me for any reason, my last name is Gilzo. There's like 20 of us in the United States, and I'm related to most of them. So I'll just redirect that email over to me. <laughs> so yeah, we got 15 minutes to lunch. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. How do you think about like when you're deciding what to end to end test? Is it always like some sort of front end functionality that you're testing, or like how do you decide more broadly what to So it's going this tool isn't going to be less if you're looking for like API tests. This is going to be for web based applications, which most always will be inside some web interface. There are other tools that can do API testing directly. You could fake API testing if you really need to. Um, but this isn't meant for that. But this is like the best that you should are basically the shape of what you usually use it for, clicking yes. on something, logging. Yes. Yeah. Well, you need to mimic a user's behavior through the application and validate some feature or function. This is what you use. Cool. Yeah. So, like to piggyback off, yeah. I was just talking with my colleague, and it's like we have half a dozen very bespoke pages that we never think about because they just sit there and work, but we don't know if they go down until someone tells us they did. So, like for us, like that would be is it usually something that we change that negatively impacts that? And because it's a page that we look at once a year, right? It's just you don't think about it, but if you write the test for it, then yep. yeah, absolutely. There's like, oh yeah, I need to go sweep that before we deploy. So I mean, as I think as an example, the actual task I was given is done. We have multiple, we have multiple products, we have multiple documentation sites for all of them. I guess there is a bug somewhere that occasionally will change the search index on the products. So you go to search in one product, you get the results for another one. So my end-to-end -end test is to go in and run searches and ensure that the search results you're getting match the product and then flag those before they go to production. Yeah. yeah. So you know, like a lot of this is based on like the, the application and stuff you're you're building, but is there any advantage to like actually because like when you're, especially when you're working with WordPress, you're often modifying a lot of core. So yeah. is it is it helpful or is there like a base package to actually test core before you go in and test like your individual parts of the application? You know what I mean? Like is there like a is there a library you can pull and be like make sure actually regular WordPress is here first and then test on our layered functionality? So core again, they switch to playwright. So they have the playwright tests. They they abandoned the Cypress test years ago, so no, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so I would say if that is that that's a crucial piece, then I would look at Playwright. And it's not like Playwright's bad. I, I don't want anybody to think that Playwright's like you should use it. I mean, it's just it's the new. It's only a couple years old. It's fairly new. The documentation is there, but not as extensive. So if that's an important piece feature, I'd say check out Playwright, and then that way you've got their test that you can run. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if you like. Actually, like actually need to test like everything that core is testing. No. You know, just like just 
overview, like, oh, WordPress is here. You know what I mean? Like, right. So, I mean, that's another example. Like, we manage, uh, we need to do the one, one click deploys, right? We manage those. And so, I have all the updates for those automated. And as part of the test, I do a quick check of four <laughs> features to make sure the most important features are there so that none of our custom code has negatively affected any of the four features. So, yeah, I mean, I've done that. And no reason you can. Yeah. Can you, um, can you interact with that clone? Like yeah. production side, if you if you want to do your own manual testing uh, or something, like no, you can't. Like it's going to save the state of each one, but you can't click and do additional things. You can't like log in yourself and try stuff. Mm -hmm. You'd have to just write the test for it. All right, I, I think you're just asking, can you as a human visit the platform? Yeah, as, as a human. Oh, VR environment. Oh, VR environment. Oh, absolutely. I thought you meant the testing environment that we saw. It brought up, showed us the test. No, no, I meant. Like, oh yeah, that yeah yeah that. Using the flow and using like the new code and the. Oh, absolutely. Site, like it'd be cool to be able to interact with that. Yeah, yeah, you can absolutely do that. In fact, you can do that to help write your test too. Like when you go right. and check check it, use that as where you're recording all the steps that you're taking. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Anybody? Yeah. yeah um, so how um, does, um, do you have any visual regression in your staff that, you're, that you do? So oh, I do, yes. And with these tools? Mm -hmm. So that's a separate tool. Yeah. Um, I use, and I'm going to forget it, it's got a monkey face. Uh, oh, I forget the visual regression testing name. Yes, and I will remember about two seconds after you all leave what the name of that is. Uh, there is an open source backstop. Uh -huh. Backstop. Uh, we use backstop for visual regression testing to make sure there's no visual regression. If you're not familiar with visual regression testing, what it does is you give it a production site or a baseline site uh, that should be correct. And then you give it your testing environment, your development stage, APR, whatever environment. And it takes screenshots of locations that you identify and it dips them. And if the dip is greater than some percentage that you define, then it flags it as a false or that there has been some regression. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can add in, and I would encourage you to add in as many of these kind of automated tests as you can to reduce the number of man hours that you're having to put into this stuff. Because I know in higher ed, you don't have the time. You just get more responsibilities, not more people. So anytime you can automate these kind of things, the better. Any other questions? Yes. Someone mentioned uh, SSO. Yes. And we tried B Hat like years ago and had trouble with logging into WordPress to do any of the inside stuff. We were able to do front end, but not like log in okay. and post. So I'm assuming you have a test user in the single sign on system where you can have the password somewhere to actually use, you should be able to do it. I don't foresee any problems with SSO. So I can't say I've tested it recently with SSO, but okay. it should work. We haven't done that with Cypress. Okay. We've done it with Puppeteer with AWS okay. and that the same thing with the same environment. And yeah, it, it actually works the right way. And that's a good point. Uh, whether you do Cypress or you do Puppeteer or you do Playwright, the concepts are all basically the same. It's just the specifics of maybe how you write the test, right? So if you start playing with Cypress, and you decide this isn't going to work for us. It's not like you've really lost anything. I mean, a little bit of time to learn the specifics, but you can just take that same testing ideology and move it over to the next product. Any other questions? Are we ready for lunch? Uh, there is one. I'm sorry. There oh, is there one online? Sorry. There's one question from online. Oh, so the teardown set. Yeah, so you can, so in the state, um, so when I mentioned I test the users for uh, WordPress 4, what I have to do is I have functions that I've written in Cypress that will connect to that environment and create the dynamic user just like I did. Actually, first it deletes the user, deletes all the posts, deletes everything about the user. Then it creates the user, retrieves back the password, and then sets that as a Cypress environment variable, and then kicks off Cypress. So that's how I manage that. And you'll have to do a similar thing. You can do it in the GitHub Actions if you want. There's no reason you don't, I mean, you can. But Cypress, since it has those hooks, you can do a before hook and say, before I run any of these authenticated tests, run all this setup stuff, or the before each. Where it's GitHub Actions, it's going to be mainly before and after. I think that's the only online question. Yep. All right. So, if no, there are any other questions. Again, I'll be here the rest of the time. 
until Saturday. Feel free to grab me, ask me any more questions about anything. I love automation. So if it's testing, DevOps, any of that stuff, I love it. Happy to talk um, and feel free to reach out. Otherwise, we're heading.